So what actually, if we just elaborate on that structure a little bit more now, as you will see here, I'm trying to mimic the stack here and I am growing the stack upwards. Now, purists among you will say, ah, but in programming language, for all sorts of technical reasons, particularly with compiled languages, actually, you don't grow the stack from low memory to high memory addresses. Well, I do it this way around because, frankly, it's a lot more convenient with this model I've got. Although if you're purist about it, you will say a huge number of runtime situations in real languages do it the other way around. They build the stack starting from the highest point of memory that they've allocated themselves. I've grabbed myself two gig and at the top of that memory area, that's the base of my stack and I'm going to grow it downwards. Yeah, but I'm still saying to you that this ring here that I can just about grab hold of there, it's still logically the top of the stack. You might say, ah, oh, but it's the, the lower memory address. Yes, I know, but it's still logically the top point of the stack. You'll often get something like your program at the lowest addresses, then immediately above it, static or global data. And then very often, there, up at the top of your available memory, you grow the stack downwards and very often also, Sean wants me to talk about this, but this will have to wait a while because many have requested this, is there's a heap allocation area. Now, you know now because we've done so much on stacks, stacks is at least disciplined. It's last in, first out storage. You know, the way you push stuff on, you pop it off. You can't muck about in the middle. You really cannot. It's off the top, pushed, popped, whatever. So the stack is disciplined. The heap is where you just grab, say, grab me a chunk of memory to do such and such. And its maintenance of the heap is a lot more problematical <clears throat> because you can get big chunks of stuff allocated on there, which then become not needed anymore. You've got to have a an ability to throw it away and to do heap management. But that, this is where it comes from then. Very often what you're doing is you can grow the heap, you can grow the stack down and you make sure all the time that they don't collide with one another. So back to this mechanism of saying that for my purposes what I'm going to do is to grow the stack from low memory addresses to high. So what I've got here is, if you like, my base area on the stack, which has got, I don't know, I, I might have declared all sorts of stuff inside my main program, all sorts of integer, real variables, whatever. There's all sorts of admin locations. This is a memory model, you see, of the stack. From within main, I call up factorial four. Here is my stack frame for doing factorial of four. Now, you might say, well, what's in these frames? What, what, what does a frame mean? Well, it's not just one location. It's a whole bunch of locations. And typically, what will happen is your stack frame is divided into three subsections very often. I could call the lower one here the admin area. What that is saying is, I'm starting here with this new frame. I would very much like to remember where is the memory address of where I started. This is often called the frame pointer, FP for short. When I was back in Maine and this thing didn't exist, this also had its own frame pointer down here at the, if you like, the zero of our stack base down here. So what you might store in things like admin is things like the old value of the frame pointer. Not this one, but if I ever needed to restore it back to here, whereabouts in memory was that one? So old frame pointer, things called program counters, which is where was I in the program when I broke off? 
to set up this frame and start calculating. So the admin area, things you mustn't lose track of. And here's the easier things to understand. Here in this area, building up in these locations here, are your actual parameters. And the actual parameter for our call of factorial is just n. In the actual parameter area, we can put ourselves a, a location here that's got, can I squeeze that in? It's actually got our magic four in it. What is often the case, not very clear at the moment because factorial is an incredibly simple function. You will remember that although it's got an incoming n, I didn't need in that recursive version to declare any local variables inside of factorial. But let me just say that this part is set aside for your local variables and there might be lots of them. Within factorial you might be declaring real numbers, more integers, more everything. But they belong within the factorial domain and they're there. So you've got admin locations, you've got incoming actual parameters, you've got local variables, if any. Okay, so what's going to happen now is really <laughs> incredibly simple, and I've been doing it on here, is I'm saying that I now need to put up a stack frame for factorial 3. Factorial 2. Finally, way up at the top, factorial 1. Now, over here, in a separate area of memory, which is probably actually under here, here is the program area. Here is, in some sense, buried in here, is the factorial code. The actual translated into machine code thing that makes factorial work. And you remember earlier on, I emphasized to you, can't emphasize too strongly, you are reusing the same code over and over and over again. But and you say, well, how can that possibly work? Why aren't you trampling all over yourself? And the answer is that the two things which you have to keep track of if you're an assembler programmer, but if you're a high-level language programmer, even with something like C, you give thanks that the compiler does it for you. You must keep track of where all these frames start. So we have the frame pointer originally here, for the first frame, then the frame pointer moves up to here, okay, for that frame, then we would move to there, and right up at the very top, the top of stack is often called the stack top pointer, SP for short. So as big as the stack gets, at the very top it's got a stack pointer, but at various levels down below there are areas of the stack that correspond to the frames and you get one frame for every invocation of factorial. So let's bury ourselves inside the code now and say, all right, it works like this. <coughs> I'll do a little... We'll go into this, okay, so, yeah. So, inside the factorial code, what it says is, for factorial 4, I'm four times whatever factorial 3 is, yeah? But I don't know what factorial 3 is. So I can't do the multiply yet. I can't do the multiply until I've built another stack frame that tells me what um, the answer to factorial 3 is. Okay, so now it's fortunately the case that when things give back simple integer answers inside the CPU, there is a convention, I'll use this one because it works right in the ARM chip, that the answer in register 0, which is what this is, is always the integer answer from the function you've just called. 
So here we are, look. Factorial 1 delivered a 1. But then inside that frame, what you're waiting to do is to say it is, that gets delivered back as the answer 1 in R0 and we're back in factorial 2. We must pull the frame pointer back from here to here and we must pick up that the pending multiply we are waiting to do because we know what question mark is now, it's 1, it's been reduced to 0. Where do I pick up that 2 from? Ah, well the 2 was the actual parameter and the actual parameter is always a known distance from the frame pointer. So if we said, all right, the, I need four locations for admin, but then frankly, the incoming n is always five, one, two, three, four, five locations beyond where the current frame pointer is, get hold of that location's contents, and the answer is, over here, this is where the two is held inside the actual parameter area. So that's not, as it were, buried in the code forever and always. What it says is, go to where the frame pointer is, look five locations ahead. Oh, and the answer's two. So I need to do two times whatever is now in register one. And the answer to that is two. Where do you deliver that back? Ah, you deliver that back by overwriting register zero and pulling, this is the key thing, this is what C does for you and always gets it right as it pulls back the frame pointer. How does it know where to pull it back to? Ah, well in the admin information at the start of every frame is an entry that says what was the frame pointer at previously. So you pull that back. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that care about these things in the ARM chip, the recommendation in the ARM recommendations for procedure handling is to use register 11 to be the frame pointer. So a register inside the CPU points at your current frame. The actual parameter, the instance of n that you've stored in that frame, is always a certain known distance from the frame pointer. And you pull that back in as one operand of your pending multiply and the other operand is the fact that the level above you delivers back its integer answer in register zero. So you do that multiply and you pass it yet another level down. So the overall picture then, and of course, <laughs> I hope there's enough sketch here to give you the, some of the details. The fine, hyper fine details would take me the rest of the day. What it comes down to is you set up a frame and inside those frames, there is your local value of n, which all different, 4, 3, 2, and 1, waiting there to take part in a multiply. Right up at the top, the factorial 1 says, my answer is 1, I'm going to leave that in register 0. You then come back into the same code, which says, once you've returned from the frame above, do your pending multiply. Trust the frame pointer, because it will have been put back for you. Go 5 ahead of it pick up the local instance of n, multiply it by what's in R0, and then overwrite R0 with that answer. Then pull back the frame pointer, exit from the routine. So you can get the picture now, I think, that's in the C program. Whenever you see that thing called return, the C compiler is doing one heck of a lot of work for you that you are very glad you don't have to do for yourself. It's not just jumping back to where it came from, it's adjusting frame pointers galore to make sure that when you get back and reuse the same code, you pick up the correct N. Why do you pick up the correct N? It's because the assembler level code says the local N is 5, in my case, I'm just guessing, it's 5 beyond where the frame pointer is. So always, by subverting the frame pointer and changing it as you come back down the stack, you pick up the correct N, you do your pending multiply, and out at the bottom drops your answer.